Hello everyone and welcome back to the life and suffering of Sir Bronte. So in the last episode, we did all that we could in the name of unity. We tried as much as we possibly can to keep this family together. And yeah, it's been a rough go, but it's we're, we're doing what we can. We're doing what we can. Um, justice is still pretty high, so maybe we can still pull out some stops, but we're heading towards the end of this chapter and we're heading towards the end of this period in our life. So we really need to do all that we can in order to try and keep everything together so we can be ennobled by the sword. But we'll see how things turn out in the end. Also, once again, I cannot say this enough. I cannot stress this enough. Thank you, everyone, for the views and the subscriptions and everything else in between. It has blown my mind <laughs> how many views and stuff these videos have gotten. I really didn't expect this, especially for this type of game, because, you know, these games are long. They're very narrative driven and typically people don't want to see that type of stuff. So it's it's very encouraging. And, and again, I cannot thank everyone enough for the love and the support. It's just been wonderful. And also, um, I've seen a couple questions about whether or not um, I would do another playthrough. Sure, I mean, if people wanna watch it, if that, that's something that people are interested in, I am more than happy to turn around and do an, another playthrough. I was actually thinking about doing another playthrough because as of right now, I don't really have anything else planned to play. I was thinking about maybe playing uh, Lakeview Cabin coming up pretty soon because I have some time uh, after this video because there's nothing else out. There's literally nothing else out. Um, and of course, the only real big thing that I had planned coming up was when Mass Effect comes out. And um, I wasn't sure if I was actually gonna do that all in one sitting. I was thinking about streaming that actually because it's just such a long game, but it is literally probably, it's probably my favorite game of all time. So yeah, that's just certain things I had planned going out. But um, yeah, I'll do a poll or something probably at the end of this chapter or at the end of this series. And if people want to see a different playthrough, sure, by all means, I'll be more than happy to do the priest side. And I think the priest side is split into two different sides. I'll be more than happy to do the other one where I think it's uh, the lotless route. So yeah, but anywho, that's for another time and another period. So let's get back into it. A realm unknown. We have to do some little, a little bit of spy work here. So it seems so uh, our knights, has changed. Following the prefect's instructions, you come at the appointed hour to an, in an inconspicuous mansion on the edge of Anazette with a spacious yard and a tall fence around it. The gatekeepers bow and open the gate as soon as they see you. It seems the mask is enough to convince them you belong inside. Inside the yard, you see noble carriages, many more than you had expected. You are ushered in into a dressing room of sorts. A change of clothes already awaits you inside. It is a curious garb, a square of flowing, sparkling cloth with clasp and cords to keep it from unwrapping. You've never seen anything like it. With this strange robe and the gilded mask over your normal clothes and face, you cannot help but feel rather silly. This attire feels positively unsuitable for any kind of plotting or scheming. You know, unless you do. Oh yeah, yeah, this is definitely Cthulhu or Reptilians, one or the other. Anyway, um, oh God, I have low disk space. Okay, hold on one second. Sorry about that, so I had a little problem with some disk space. I don't know where the hell that came from, but whatever, anywho. Next, you proceed to a large room. The windows are covered in black cloth to keep prying eyes away, but you forget about it moment le moments later. What seems to be a strange performance is playing out before your very eyes. You hear droning, unfamiliar music coming seemingly from nowhere. You see candlelight dancing and glimmering. Ribbons of gold and silver are hung along the walls as decoration. And there are people, many people like you, they are dressed in flowing robes and delicate gilded masks with narrow slits for eyes. The people are talking. They stand unexpectedly close to one another which is odd for these days, their hands on each other's shoulders. You approach one of the groups, hoping to overhear the subject of their conversation, but you almost recall when several arms reach out at once, attempting to grasp you tenderly by the shoulder. Stealing yourself, you put a hand on another person's forearm. The masked people seem friendly and genial. No one appears surprised by your insecurity. And their conversations are also quite out of the ordinary. You hear unfamiliar names, names that could belong to legendary heroes of old or to people here who have taken them as secret identities. 
You hear mentions of books you do not know and emotions they felt while reading them. Their conversations feel like a strange dream. You hear several voices singing in a far off corner of the room. There are no lyrics to the song. Each voice maintains its own note. Together, these voices form a tender, softly aching melody. It feels enrapturing. It spirits you away. You feel so distant now from the purpose of your visit, so withdrawn from the judge's trade, so far away from the empire and from your very self. A hand touches your shoulder, bringing you back to your senses. A pair of unfamiliar eyes look at you intently from behind a glinting greenish silver mask. They belong to Octavia. You pull back and bow to the Archduke's daughter. I believe I recognize the man behind this mask. Never expected to see you here today, my extraordinary human. But I must behave here. You'd best do the same. We're not alone. It would be best if we are not seen too close to one another. As for this place, Sir Bronte, allow me to explain. This is my circle of La Terra. And before you ask, no, we do not plot, nor do we scheme. We've removed ourselves as far as possible from such machinations. This place is a little world of our own, a brief respite from tradition and noble customs and other such fuss. Our gathering is but a pretense, a game of make-believe. We pretend we are neither nobles nor citizens of the blessed empire, nor humans nor Archneans, but the Latari. Do you know what this word means? I would not be surprised if you've never heard of the Latari. These days, the people of Latari are mentioned only in rare historical works. Long before us, in an age when this land was fertile and green, the Latari lived upon the land that would become Magra. They were masters of a remarkable art. They could create worlds from nothing but their conscious minds. Many of these people come here for simple entertainment and a brief taste of freedom. Others seek a respite from the binding customs of the noble lot. Still, others feel encumbered by their blood tides and ancestral obligations. Only here are we fully free from the burden of our past and our present. Yet some among us seek more than brief moments of freedom. They are drawn here by a fascination with the Latari and their idea that our entire existence can be shaped by the mind alone. We strive to know the Latari people from our, for ourselves. We strive to continue their teachings. We strive to become, become them. If we happen to master the art of shaping worlds from our own minds, we may yet break free of the trap that is this harsh existence. Surprised by this, you ask her why she is telling you this so openly. She knows that the ritual of extinct races are held in the same regard as magic and punishable as such. In response to your question, Octavia suddenly takes off her golden mask and reveals a slight smile on her once hidden face. May your voice near speak words of deceit. To great shame lies the path of untruth. Where an Archnian lies, where a human denies. The Latari speak truly, forsooth. I'm not afraid. The truth of the Latari matters more to me than any persecution. You came here in secret and wearing a mask, which means the prefecture has taken an interest in my little gatherings. But I'm confident you will describe this as, uh, I lost my place, God, God, God. But I'm confident you will describe this as an innocent club of young nobles and keep our fragile world from prying eyes and ears. Would you do this for me, Darren Bronte? These words spoken by Octavia sound more like an assertion than a question, an assertion, excuse me. But you are in no hurry to respond. Your thoughts are tangled, lost among the echoing voices, fluid motions, and transcendent music. This gathering is in violation of the law. This you cannot deny. All rituals of extinct races were banned at the foundation of the empire. You may summon the gendermes here at any moment. You need only give a sign to the driver. And when they get here, the circle of Latari will be gone in an instant. You will prove to the city that not even the most noble of its denizens are above the law. But Octavia will never forgive you. You could, on the other hand, keep the Circle of Lataria secret from Melbourne and report this meeting as a harmless gathering of young nobles looking for an opportunity to socialize. But if the secret chancellery ever takes interest in these meetings, you will be powerless. Someone has already reported Octavia's circle to the prefecture. 
there's a very good chance these reports will continue. Perhaps if you tell Octavia of the danger she's, she is facing, she will disband the circle herself, herself. There's one more way you can resolve this predicament. With a piece of paper, some ink, and a bit of skill, the Circle of Latari could become a noble historical society, one of many dozens of Anazets of Anazet alone. Legitimized by the city, Octavia's gathering would remain a secret within this mansion. But do you have enough influence to make this possible? And would it be wise to expend it in this way? I'm willing to bet money I don't have that option. <laughs> Say something, Darren. This is not the time to be quiet. The great mystery of Latari is about to begin. Oh, well shit, I actually do. Huh. All right, so I can keep their secret, and if I do, the Latari ritual will be in my destiny. Justice will go down by one. Theology will go up by one. Willpower will go up by five. Octavia's opinion of me will go up by one, but Elborn's opinion will go down by one. If I ban the circle, justice goes up by one. My reputation goes down by one. Um, my eloquence goes up by one. Theology goes up by one. But my relations with Octavia will go down by two. If I convince Octavia to disband the circle, I have that because I just have barely enough manipulation. And of course my relations with Octavia are very high. I will get justice plus one, manipulation plus one, but Octavia's opinion of me will go down by one. Not bad. If I legitimize it, however, my wealth will go up by one, diplomacy will go up by one, theology will go up by one, and my willpower will go down by five, but Octavia's opinion of me will go up by one. Hmm, interesting. So, hmm, I think I'll do this because I'm curious about who the Latari is and what we might find out in the end. Willing to bet money that they have something to do with the twins, but you know. It also kind of reminds me of uh, Dragon Age, how you have the, uh, I don't remember what they're called, but it's the mages, uh, the dreamers or whatever. They're really powerful mages that can craft things in their dreams. So it kind of reminds me of that. But yeah, I'm legitimized the circle. Gotta, you know, keep good relations with my boo thing. She need, I gotta, you know, have her have my babies. Anywho, you chuckle, shaking your head. How quaint. A group of nobles hiding from sight, wearing masks, studying the culture of a long dead race. Has Lady Octavia never considered taking her historical studies a bit more seriously? Octavia's eyes narrow, trying to discern the meaning behind your words. There is a way to make the meetings of the circle fully legitimate, you continue. You have enough influence to get the papers they need and have them signed by the right people. Octavia's face lightens up. She continues your half-finished thought right away. Indeed, my dear Sir Bronte, welcome to a meeting of our Imperial Historical Society. Truly, you would be so kind as to procure us a proper plaque for the door. You nod. With a genial smile, Octavia extends her hand to you. You take it and kiss it gently. If only we were alone so I could show you the full extent of my gratitude. But the great mystery of the night is about to begin. You should leave us. You'll bring danger upon the circle if you are seen coming here again. You'd best get those papers prepared right away, kind Darren. The members of the circle are already gathering in the middle of the room, ready to begin their mysterious ritual. You feel dozens of eyes on you from behind their gilded mask. They will not begin until you leave the circle. Following Lady Octavia's suggestion, you change into your normal clothes and leave the mansion. The next day, you report to Elborn and put his concerns to rest. There is no sign whatsoever of any noble plot. The group is nothing but a historical society run by several young nobles who meet to discuss the cultures of old. They simply lack legitimacy, but you can rectify that. This sounds suspicious, Bronte. The Archduke's daughter is involved. I hope you know what you're doing. Either way, I'm glad we didn't sick the gender me's on them. I hope the Secret Chancellery and Sir El Firo never learn of those reports. I doubt the advisor would be as tolerant of their youthful amusements. You are sure the prefect that Lady Octavia's historical society will have all the permits they need to operate without arousing suspicion. And so the Anazet Historical Society for the Study of Ancient Peoples is founded. The city hall wastes no time approving the necessary paperwork. Every official there knows the judge that Judge Bronte is a respectable gentleman with friends in high places. And your busy patrons pay no heed to the follies of a young nobles. Octavia sends you her reward in the form of a letter. 
and you open the envelope to read it, a gilded key clinks onto the floor. Darren, I'm impressed by your abilities. You know how to use your connections and bring me joy. It pleases me to know that I was right about you. A chest matching this key will be delivered to your estate tonight. Farewell, Darren. It will be some time before we meet again. I have much to do on my own. I cannot help but think of Octavia and those who followed her. They have dared to reject their nature, lot, and birth in an, in an attempt to become something else entirely. But do they have what it takes to cast off the shackles of their existence? Or are they nothing but madmen who yearn for the impossible? As for Octavia and her circle of Latari, you hear nothing of them for a long time. After that night, the Archduke's daughter seems to vanish from the social circles of Anazette. She has never been one to tell you about her plans. Your encounters with her have ended as abruptly as they had begun. Huh. Interesting. I, I need you, woman. I, I need you to chill back up. What are you doing? I need you to save me. Interesting, though. Interesting. We are getting closer and closer to the end. I'm assuming when I get to 30, then that's when everything is going to end. The year is 1143. The last straw. Rumors are running wild in Anazette. People say that a mysterious clandestine society called the Last Straw holds the entirety of the city's seedy underbelly in its clutches, with men in safe houses all over Anazette plotting and scheming against the nobles and the rulers of the province. Their leader is a woman, a ruthless criminal by the name of Sophia. She, is, she has evaded all attempts at capture. Oh boy. The common people both fear the Last Straw and sympathize with their cause. If the rumors are true, the city finally has someone who will stop at nothing to help the people claim their rights. But who will support this secret organization? And how did the insurgents manage to survive this long? No one in the city knows the answer. Magistrate El Vermin must assuage the people's fears once again. The vow mutineers and heretics who call themselves the last straw will be caught and executed very soon, and anyone who has given them money and shelter will meet the same fate. The secret chancellery will make sure of that. But even facing a manhunt, the last straw still endures. Slowly but surely, the influence of this underground organization is spreading throughout the city. Interesting. Oh boy, the wealth of Magra is misery and devastation. Good God. There's a struggle for power. Couple more points and the commoners will be in power. And the order is discontent. Threats and promises. You are in the middle of ascending the city hall's long curved marble staircase, a small man beneath the building's towering vault. You were suddenly visited that night by the messengers from Magistrate El Vermin. They insist the reason was most urgent. You are already expected upstairs. There's a deafening silence in the lavishly decorated corridors, your footsteps the only noise you can hear. Finally, you enter the spacious room that is the office of El Vermin, a stately official of considerable age. You find him sitting in his comfortable chair of carved wood. He acknowledges your presence with a nod, however the magistrate is not alone. At the window of the office stands a tall Arknian. The cape of the Imperial Legion covers his shoulders. He is Dorius Otten, the commander of Magra, in the flesh. He does not even bother to turn around and look at you. The magistrate gestures to you formally, beckoning you closer. Judge Bronte, you've come at last. Sir Auden has been eagerly awaiting your arrival. You see, the commander has learned about a litigation being prepared against him at the prefecture. He demanded that an end be put to these machinations at once, and I humbly offered him my assistance. Slowly, Auden turns to face you. He eyes you with cold contempt. Bronte, you again. So you've been chosen to oversee this so-called case against me. I don't envy you. I will be brief. I will not stand idly by in the face of slander and baseless accusations. Give me your word of honor as a nobleman that you will do everything in your power to put a stop to this litigation. Only then will you be free to leave. I will treat any other answer as an insult against my noble lineage. And let it be known that Sir Elvermin holds many positions such as the chairman's seat at the court of honor. 
which means that any insult will be soon followed by a legitimate duel of honor. I'm sure you know full well how others have fared in duels against me. Oh boy. Hmm. So I do have one thing that I can use. Oh, good. My valor is high enough. Why, thank you. Auden turns towards the window before you say anything as if answers has already, uh, as if your answer has already been heard. Magistrate O'Vermin watches Auden and you're silent and you silently with a mysterious smirk. You stand before the two lords of the city, a young man only recently ennobled by the mantle. Any word that leaves your lip now will affect your fate. Let me see, I can put Auden at ease if I had enough manipulation, um, but I don't. I can retaliate against him. My reputation goes up, my valor goes up, my death goes up, uh, and my willpower goes down. Or I can give Odd my word. My career goes down by one and justice goes down by one. Um, hmm. Well, let's see. To be fair, all these are pretty shite. So, fuck you. If Odin challenges you to a duel, a lesser death is certain. Any attempt to avoid it will only be delay will only delay the inevitable. So it'd be best to confront him now. And so, head held high, you place your hand on the hilt of your sword and take a step closer to Odin. Next come the words, your words, echoing loudly in the stunned silence of the city hall. Indeed, you are the judge in charge of Odin's case, and you will see it through to the very end. Your duty and your honor demand that you serve the Empire and enforce its laws, which apply to all its subjects. Yes, Odin will surely defeat you in a duel, in a sacred duel, even though I am invisible by my stats. But the evidence you have gathered against him will see light nevertheless. You are far from the only judge ready to challenge even the most powerful nobles of the province in the name of the law. And no matter what, justice will find Odin and strike him down. Odin is stunned by your verbal assault. For a moment, he remains motionless by the window, his face an, an azure mask. Slowly, the commander of Mario walks towards you, his heavy, piercing gaze transfixing you. You, a human, dare to threaten me. You calmly meet his eyes in total silence. Then suddenly, a grimace of rage splits the Arthian's face. His sword flashes like lightning. You barely have time to draw your own blade. The clanging of swords cuts through the stunned silence of the city hall. Auden lets out a torrent of strikes in an attempt to overwhelm you. Again and again, you barely deflect him. The Arcnean's command of the blade is impeccable. You cannot possibly stand your, your ground against him for long. You cannot find even a single opening to strike back as Ed Auden's fierce assault drives you towards the window. A commanding voice calls out from the other side of the office. Sir Auden, what do you think you're doing? For a moment, Auden stops. This is your chance. You prepare to strike him down as quickly as you can, but the commander of Magra notices your movement. He steps to the side and runs you through with his sword. A cold wave washes over you as the steel enters your body. You slowly collapse onto the marble floor, barely able to move. Auden stands tall over you, panting with rage. Sir Auden, what have you done? This is no honorable noble duel. It is a murder in the heart of the city hall, in front of the chairman of the court of honor, no less. I insist that you leave Bronte alone from now on. One death is enough for him. Yeah, uh, uh, you mean the two that he's given me now? Having caught his breath, Auden slowly wipes his sword and sheaths it again. You forget yourself, Elvermin. You're as much a human as he. Still, what you say makes sense. This judge doesn't deserve my wrath. But if he ever tries to tarnish the name of Auden again, you lie prone at the feet of your murder, your hands clutching at the wound in your chest, a tiny speck of red on your white dress shirt. Black clouds, your vision, your final thoughts freeze and slowly disintegrate as you leave your dead body and head for the glimmering white high high above. Uh, you know, if if this is going to be indicative of how things are going to go as far as Valor goes, can you just not have invisible 
at the end of, you know, maxing that stat out, just have, I can swing a sword because I can swing a sword. I can also die quite a lot. Thank God for multiple deaths, even though I've just suspended two in this chapter, but come on, man. Like what's the point? Re really? What's the point of having 20 having invisible and you get mowed down every single time you think to fight. <sighs> okay. Anywho, but again, that's just a thing with a lot of choice of style games. They they have a lot of stats, a lot of times, and it's just like, what's the point of even having the stat? So, but oh well, so that's my rant. You are surrounded by an immensely gray void. There is nothing but shadows around you. The specters of your decisions, the spawn of your personal will. You see before you all your victories and defeats, all your errors and hopes. Another shadow comes to life by your side. As you gaze at the elusive moving silhouettes, you recognize your last action. This is the death you chose to face, knowing what fate was to befall you. This is the decision you made. The shadows keep spinning and dancing around you. The footprints of every step you have taken since the day you were born. A colossal figure looms over them all, your future true death. You can no longer deny its immenseness. It has always been there, waiting for you. Now you are only one step away from it, but you will take this step yourself. The familiar gigantic figures of the twin gods appear from the void to meet you. They effortless, uh, effortlessly lift your tiny soul and hold it in their hands. You've always been in the twin gods' hands. Their will created you. The elder did not grant you his love. He forced it into you. The younger shaped you according to his law without giving you a choice. An enormous whirlwind arises in the void. The twin gods release you into it, and a torrent of an unfathomable will whisk you away. You are merely a minuscule particle of this universal tide. This will is the soul of determiner is the sole determiner of all events, past, present, and future. Your puny actions and choices are nothing in the face of the force of this torrent harbors that this torrent harbors you whirl in the cosmic vortex of the twin gods will until it casts you out you careen back down to your earthly life it is only now that you regain your ability to act you see all the wheels of the universe intertwined in a perpetual struggle against one another which will you follow Hmm, the will of the elder, you follow the will of the God who brings love to the world. The will of the younger, who imposes law upon the world. Earthly power, you abide by a worldly manifestation of the law and the will of the authorities. The blood tide, you obey the will of your ancestors and your family legacy. Uh, history, history has a will of its own. You must assume the position that was assigned to you by this will. Uh... My own will. The only will you are willing to live by is your own. Uh, I will do this because I am going all in on law. You fall into an endless web formed by the wills of the, of the mortal world. Now that you are free of the cosmic vortex, you can finally exert your own will and make a choice. It feels like a first gasp of air after being suffocated by an alien will, the will of the gods. But for your chosen will, to be incarnated here in this world, one decision is not enough. You will have to follow this path to its conclusion, to turn this will into reality by way of your decisions, deeds, and actions. Your eyes snap open and you sit up abruptly. The crypt is spinning around you. The stagnant stench chokes you. You got out. You succeeded in preserving yourself against the whirlwind that was tearing you asunder. The will of the twin gods have commanded you to continue your existence. You feel the urge to fall flat on your back and cackle madly. Your back. But I only got one life left, right? You come to your senses atop the stone slab of your family crypt. For a while, you do not move, slowly getting acquainted with your body born anew. Your mother's somber silhouette stands above you, bowed in prayer. You hear her quiet, meek voice just as you did as a child. At last, you're back with us, Darren. 
My son, it pains so much to watch you sacrifice yourself so, all for the sake of your trade and your honor. You have four lives in this world by the twins' grace, each a precious gift. You've cast away the lowly lot of suffering, so I beg you, do not seek it anew. Steer clear of pain and wounds and death. Your father appears in the doorway of the crypt. He comes closer and bows to you respectfully. Son, the entire city is talking about you and your sword fight with Auden. Even the highest aristocracy believes the commander of Magra deserves all the blame for assaulting you without challenging you to a duel. While you acted like a true nobleman and defended the name, the honor of the Bronte name, you suffered a lesser death through no fault of your own. You leave the family crypt with a heavy heart. You've resisted Auden. He will not be clashing with you directly anytime soon, but his sword will continue to loom over you until this, until his case comes to an end. So we have a modest position. I've died thrice. I can't die again. Uh, my willpower went down a bit. My valor is invincible. Great. Okay. Nobleman's on. Auden's case still looms over you, a burden and a threat. As the strife between the estates grows more bitter, the judge's trade grows tougher by the day. The commoners demand more rights and legal protections. The nobles do their best to push back. As things stand right now, any verdict made in court may result in an upheaval in the province and possibly determine the outcome of your case against Auden. One day in a park by the Feliz estate, uh, estate favored by dueling Anazet nobles, you see a curly-haired young man lying prone in the small sunlit square. His body has been pierced by a sword, and it has not vanished. A true death. You are here to investigate a report of an illegal duel. The winner is still here, a slender middle-aged noble in an elegant black jacket, his hand still on the hilt of his sword surrounded by gendarmes. Your orders, your honors. Sir, Sir El Corvio will not submit on his own, and we sh wouldn't dare use force against him. You sign for the gentlemen to lower their weapons and approach the duelist. El Corvio's eyes widen and his face comes to life when he notices you. Before you ask him, the nobleman begins to speak far louder than necessary. It was a duel sanctioned by the court of honor. That is all. The late Sir El Esti questioned my loyalty to the emperor and called me an apostate. He left me no other choice but to defend my honor, and now he's dead. Please be quick with your verdict, sir judge. I'm expected at the capital. You do know who I am, don't you? Fuck, sir. Before you can say a single word, a carriage bearing the crest of Magistrate El Vermin rolls through the gate. The magistrate furrows his silvery brow, brow as he looks at the sorrowful scene, then gestures politely for El Corvio to approach his carriage. With a chuckle, the duelist walks through the line of gendarmes and leans on the carriage. Meanwhile, the magistrate takes you aside for a moment. Bronte, as you know, I'm the chairman of our city's court of honor. I refused to sanction this duel for as long as I could, since true death was on the line. But Alan El Corvio insisted that denying him would spell trouble for the city of Anazet. Regrettably, he's a small yet important person in the emperor's court. He used to command the emperor's personal guard. <laughs> okay, yeah, small person. I realize that you must uh, uh, meet out justice as your duty demands. But remember, duels of honor are one of the cornerstones of imperial tradition, one of the pillars that support the twins' divine vision for the empire. You have the authority to punish El Corvio, but be careful. He might make a dangerous enemy both for yourself and for all the nobles of Anazet. That fool L.S. didn't know this, and now he's lying there before us. We would be wise not to repeat his mistakes. The magistrate of Anazet glances around, then continues in a hushed tone. Bronte, this situation is far from ordinary. If the fate of your city means anything to you, it would be best to let El Corvio go without a trial. Anazet doesn't need any trouble from the capital, and the L.S. are not as strong as they used to be. They'll get through it. You may find him if you wish. El Corvio would pay it and move on, and justice will be done at least to some extent. However, if you can defuse this matter entirely, you will earn favor with all the aristocracy of Anazet, and I'll personally see to you, see to it, you get a swift promotion. Yeah, after you just watch me die. 
Deep in thought, you gaze upon the body of the dead duelist and the long shadow of El Corio. The decision you're about to make could influence all future duels in the province, as well as your own standing. Okay. Pronounce the court of honor illegal. Okay. So I have this because my justice is very high. My diplomacy is very high. And this would in oh, and because I did the promise with Augustine, uh, the court of honor could be banned. Power goes up by one order goes up by one. My career would be in shambles, but the justice would go up and my reputation would go down by one. I can sentence El Corvio to capital punishment. I have this because of my relations with Octavia Milanatis. Okay. Um, let's see here. My career will go down by one. Justice would go up by one and wealth would go up by one. Or I could find him. Career would go up by one. Justice would go down by one. Diplomacy would go up by one and willpower would go up by five. Interesting. Hmm. This. Hmm. Oh boy. This is interesting. This is very interesting. Huh. Hmm. I actually don't know what to do this once. Huh. Because I feel like if I turn around and do pronounce the court of honor illegal. Hmm. I feel like this would save me. Because if I turn around and do this, I'm pretty sure I'm going to run into a duel at some point. And I'm pretty sure my ass is going to get handed to me, even though I'm invisible. However, I feel like this is the more diplomatic route because it puts justice at an eight. It also gives my family some wealth and it doesn't throw my career to the point to where it'll be in serious trouble. Let's see here. Where is it? Where it is it? It's destiny, province, occupation. Yeah, so it will go up to an eight. It will still be within this. This would be a four. Yeah, so I would still be a judge. Whereas if I turn around and do the other one, it would throw me in a dangerous position. Huh. But I feel like if I don't do the other one, then it would put me in a dangerous position anyway, because then I'm probably going to have to fight odd. Oof. And I think the game kind of works like how um, rain works, where if things are thing, things are too high or too low, it's pretty much a game over or it'll pretty much put you in a very shitty situation. So because I had that happen in my other playthrough when I wasn't recording that time once before, I had a incident where um, a case came up and I think Elborn warned me that I had to go in favor um, the nobles because if I didn't it would throw things into a tizzy and then my career was in shambles I think I had a one so it was pretty bad um, I'm not going to go this far I am going to sentence El Corvo to capital punishment um, and hope that I don't run into another duel that I'm going to lose you shake your head dispassionately Enunciating every word with perfect precision, even though I'm tongue-tied, you explain the situation to El Vermin. A murder in a duel is still a murder, and the punishment for murder is execution. You do not have the right to distort the law. The magistrate face falls in surprise. Bronte, you don't seem to realize how the world works. I just told you El Corvio's play... Uh, I just told you El Corvio plays an important role in the Emperor's court. Are you really so eager to make enemies? Well, you're about to. No connection will protect you if you're so intent upon trampling ancient noble traditions. It seems El Vermin is not aware that you have friends in very high places. You tell him in turn. The Archduke's family will readily side with you. The magistrate dashes to El Corvio, fuming with rage at your words. So El Corvio, this is, this is a terrible misunderstanding. 
I'll do everything I can to right this wrong, but these good sirs mean to have you arrested. You give the Jindermies a firm order, seize the murderer's sword, shackle him, and take him to the prefecture. You dare call me a murderer? Doesn't anyone in your filthy, decrepit province know the meaning of a duel? El Corvio draws his sword and assumes a defensive stance, startling the Jindermies with such a fervent refusal to comply. You start giving commands to the Jindermies. Follow, following your orders, they manage to surround and disarm El Corvio. Even the Jindermies can fight. I can't even fight. Jesus. <laughs> you head for the prefecture to take care of the paperwork and send a message to Octavia. You ask your powerful benefactors to convince the aristocracy to side with you in ordering the death penalty for El Corbio. He is a complete outsider in the Magra, you write, who happened to murder the heir to the ancient bloodline of El Est. Surely Octavia can aid her humble servant in such a trifling matter. Her reply takes almost no time to arrive. El Corbio is a staunch follower of the Tempest and the new overseer. This puts him at great odds with my father. Removing him would be easy, especially if you have the have a proper case against him. Rest assured, Darren, the Milanatus dynasty will side with you in this trial. As for the other nobles, have no fear. I will let no harm come to you, my dearest human. You talk to me sometimes like I'm some plaything. Again, I don't mind, but you know, okay. El Corvio's trial comes and goes incredibly quickly. This seat the seats in the courtroom are absolutely empty. No noble risk appearing in defense of the visitor from Eterna and attracting the displeasure of Archduke Milanatus. One by one, you present evidence of El Corvio's guilt. The ill-fated noble visitor's cold, uh, visitor coldly spits out threats in return. The Board of Justice, presided over by El Born, makes, it, makes its final judgment. Sending a noble to the hereafter is never easy, but there are times when the court has no other way to instill respect for the imperial law among those of the noble estate. Sir El Corvio, we hereby sentence you to true death by decapitation. The sentence will be carried out in Majesty Square tomorrow. El Corvio is silent, unwilling to believe in what has just happened, but the verdict has been made. El Corvio is taken to the dungeons, the shackles still on his wrist. Tomorrow, the city of Anazet will, for the first time, witness a noble being executed for a duel. The aristocracy of Anazet is indignant over your decision. They fear what might come next. And yet El Corvio's shameful end on the executioner's block goes seemingly unnoticed in the capital. Soon, rumors begin to spread. Some say the beheaded nobleman was indeed a traitor to the crown. Why else would the emperor's court ignore the beheading entirely? Or was it all the handiwork of Archduke Milanatus himself? Soon after the execution, something arrives on your doorstep. A small yet hefty chest with a note attached. Sir Bronte, we realize how difficult it must have been for you to deliver this strict yet righteous verdict. We mourn the loss of our son who transgressed against the law forbidding all duels. Yet justice has found his murderer thanks to you. Please accept this humble gift as a token of our gratitude. Sir Constance L. S. and Lady Margaret L. S. Noice. Yep, got a little wealth there. Working on that. Working on that. I, I think. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm almost there. I'm almost there. Well, actually, no, I'm there. The buckle in the shop. This event is a consequence of your previous actions. Uh, justice greater than eight. I think this is the this is the one that I had before, and if I turn around and vote in favor of the commoners, things kind of go awry. So, yep, this is the one. Your tenure as a judge has yielded considerable results. More and more often, common people come to the prefecture to assert their rights and succeed in doing so. Some local villagers have have even started coming to seek the court's protection. All over the province, there is talk that a new era has come. The law is in fact the same for all. This morning on your way to the prefecture, you anticipate a peaceful day full of paperwork. But as soon as you enter your office, Elborn rushes in after you. Don't sit down, Bronte. You've been assigned to an urgent investigation. This morning, a tradeswoman, old Miss Steiner, came to the prefecture with her two grandchildren. She demands that we punish Sir Elverger for setting fire to her shop 
and trying to rob her. Well, the Steiners had just finished writing up the complaint when Elberger himself came bursting in. He immediately sued the Steiners for his own murder. I've come to warn you, Bronte. Even though the Steiners were acting in self-defense, you still have to find in favor of Elberger. You're surprised to hear this from Elborn. Seeing your perplexed look, the prefect frowns. I'll explain. Before, low-born shopkeepers like the Steiners wouldn't, even, wouldn't have dreamed of suing a nobleman. Everything was always decided in favor of the nobility, as you may recall. But now the law has more power. Our efforts have not been in vain. However, now we're talking about the murder of a nobleman by commoners. I'm afraid these changes have been too drastic. The government elite of the province are watching our every step. Justifying the murder of a nobleman would be going too far. The overseer and the magistrate might well decide that it's time to take back the common people's rights. We can't let that happen, Darren. Court is in session. You are presiding over the Board of Justice. One bench is occupied by the somber Maximilian Elberger. His papers state that he's a nobleman of the sword, living off his estate. He strokes the pommel of his sword nervously and uh, nervously and breathes heavily ready to explode in a fit of rage. On the other bench, you see the Steiners, the lowborn owners of a well-known jewelry store. Anne Steiner, short wizened woman, wrapped in several layers of dark silk, looks defiantly at Elverger. Her two grandchildren stand silently behind her, their faces impassive. My squad noticed the fire at the Steiner's shop. We stormed in and saw those Steiners standing over the dead body of Sir Elverger and watching it crumble to dust. The old woman shouted that she had to go to the prefecture, so we brought her and her grandchildren here, and Sir Elverger suffered a lesser death before our very eyes. Miscreants, those lowborn scum killed me. You sternly call the nobleman to order. The commoners will speak first. Sir Elverger showed up at our shop at dawn and started banging on the door. We opened, despite him being completely drunk, scarcely able to stand on his feet. He demanded to see our pearls. Well, what could I do? I showed them to him. And then he started sweeping our pearls right into his own pockets. I tell him those pearls are not free, sir, but he draws his sword. I'm a nobleman, he says. Everything should be free for me. Such is your lot, he yells. Your lot is to work for me. Well, I explained that the pearls cost 20 coins, so he takes a lit lamp and smashes it on the floor, and then he charges at me with his sword. My grandchildren came to my rescue. They went and pushed him. They used no weapon naturally, so Elverger hit his temple against a showcase and fell. He came to see how he was, but he, I mean, we came to see how he was, but he was already dying. We didn't kill him, his own anger did. So I didn't come here to confess to murder, but to ask you, your honor, to protect our family against this bloodsucker. We had a hard time putting the fire in the shop out after what that rascal did. You ungrateful old hag. You should have been delighted that I was taking your pearls. All of high society would have seen them. You're a blasphemer too, not knowing your lot. The lowborn must not contradict those nobles. It's forbidden. I know my lot. I'm supposed to command. So I'm in my right when I take what I want from the rabble. And his honor, the judge, will agree with me. Oh, God. Your honor, I appeal to you, one nobleman to another. It's simply an outrage for the rabble to behave like this. Those little shopkeepers took my first life from me. Me, the heir of, to the Elverger legacy. I demand that the Steiners be hanged at once, or burned at the stake since they follow the heresy of Foltis. Only the heretics deny their lot. There's a commotion in the courtroom. Those who came to support the Steiners are infuriated by the nobleman's words. Elverger's noble friends frantically demand the lowborn, that, lo, that the lowborn be silenced. You call the court to order, but to no avail. The room will not calm down until you deliver your verdict. You rub your temple. If you manage to acquit the old lady, it will set a precedent for the entire empire. The lowborn have never had the right to defend themselves with force against one another, let alone the nobles. You have, to, you have the increased influence of the prefecture on your side. You could even try to legalize the right of the common people of Magra to defend their lives, but such a daring move will not succeed without the support of powerful people. You remember Elborn's warning. 
what would be the consequence of your decisions by uh, B for the common folk of Anazet? Should you acquit the Steiners? Can you? Oh God. And I have the same choices I had once before. So my diplomacy is high enough to acquit the Steiners. Justice will go up by two, which will throw everything into chaos. And then of course my career will be screwed. I can't, grant, I can't grant the right to self-defense because I don't have the patronage of the powerful. Even though I am literally boning one of the most powerfulest women in the, women in the empire. Can't help me. Even though she just helped me, can't help me here. Um, and in that case, I would have got power plus one, justice plus two. I still would have been screwed though. Um, diplomacy plus one, Gaius Tempest minus one. So unfortunately, I'm gonna have to punish the Steiners. So that's justice minus two, diplomacy plus one, willpower plus five. Fuck me, man. Curtly and unemotionally, you deliver your verdict. The very same verdict the majority of people in the courtroom were expecting. Elverger's demand will be satisfied. The Steiners, the Steiners committed the murder of a nobleman. Their guilt is undeniable. Whether Elverger attacked them or not is of no consequence. A commoner may not raise his hand against a nobleman. The three of them will be hanged this very day. We've never expected anything good from the upper class before, so why start now? I've heard plenty of talk about your justice, but nothing's really changed. Shame on you, Judge. The trial is over. The old woman and her grandchildren are taken away to be prepared for the execution. Elvergo lifts his hat politely and leaves. On your way out, you meet Elborn, who gives you every single case that could get you killed. The prefect follows you with a look of understanding. Fuck you, man. Jesus. Like, am I the only judge that works here? I, I, I was led to believe there were several judges here. Uh, you spent the rest of the day pacing your office mindlessly. This trying day is finally at an end. Yay, I'm a masterful diplomat. Uh, and I'm prepared for anything, except for fighting. God. What now? The hunt for Thomas. He's in jail where I put him. This event is the consequence of your previous actions. Thomas Giro not rescued. Okay. You are shaving before going to work. You scoop some warm water from the wash bin. The morning light reflected in the mirror is blinding. A servant rushes in with an urgent letter, or rather a crumbled note. He says it is from a childhood friend of yours. You flinch involuntarily. A nasty cut appears on your cheek. Darren, I'm in trouble. I knows that I help you. Now he's finally decided to get rid of me. His henchmen are on my trail already. They'll find me no matter how well I hide. You are in jail. What the hell? I'm out of time. Bronte, if you can, for the sake of our old friendship, help me out of this mess somehow. If Auden finds me, I'll be off to the shining pillar. I'm all, I'm all out of life. So am I, your friend Thomas. You crushed a note in your hands. Okay, I have a couple, I have a couple of options here. You crush the note in your hands. A drop of blood runs down your cheek. Your old friend is in danger because he helped you with the case against Otten. If you don't interfere, Thomas Giro is doomed. What was the point of putting him in jail? What was the point of that? I might as well just let him walk around. Okay, if I don't get involved, he will die. But I will get five willpower. If I protect him, oh, I die. But I have the option because my valor is high. Wonderful. Um, oh, you gotta be kidding me. You have to be kidding me. <laughs> so if I protect him, I die. Um, the rest doesn't even matter because I die and my reputation goes down. If I eliminate Odin's henchmen, my career go down, goes down by two. He's rescued and his opinion of me goes up by one, but my career is pretty much over if that happens. This, 
The, really? Really? The, these are the decisions. Oh my God, that's infuriating. I'm sorry, that, that's really infuriating. Well, come on, what, what was the point of arresting him then? Uh, God. And I'm pretty sure that if he dies, I'm gonna mysteriously not be able to turn around and use the evidence that we've worked months or years on or whatever. Uh, so I'm just gonna have to let my career just be in shambles and hopefully I can recover it, even though I don't have that much time left. Oh, God. Well, let's eliminate Odin's henchmen. Man, if only I was a judge and I could turn around and order the gendarmeries to protect him because he's in jail or put him in a more secure location, if only. Crumpling the note in your hand, you pace the room and think. The hiding place you provided for Thomas proved to be insufficient. Yes, the jail proved to be insufficient. You have not been able to save him from Auden entirely. Well, you must do it now. But finding Auden on your own would be unwise. Need a more cunning plan. This is a cunning plan. Oh, okay. Also, Elborn, what are you doing? Like, you, you are useless. How could Odin's henchmen find Thomas's hiding place, the one in jail? Only through you. But they would not be so foolish as to attack you, a prefectural judge who he already killed once. Um, excuse me. Twice now, hasn't it been? Yes, it's been twice. That means you have to get rid of them yourself. You get in your carriage and order the driver to take you in the prefecture. You find Captain Lenard. The commander of the gendarmeries greets you like an old friend. Judge Bronte, how can I be of service of you? You could protect the person that's in jail that I put there. With a mysterious air, you gesture for Lenard to come closer and inform him that an attack is planned against you tonight or the jail where he's at. Captain Lenard narrows his eyes suspicious. Keeping order is our duty, your honor. My squad will defend you. You hint to Lenard that the situation is a little more complicated than that. The perpetrators might not attack you outright. They may just threaten you, but the gendarmes have a responsibility to prevent this as well, don't they? And afterwards, perhaps they could testify in court that the criminals were about to attack you. I see. You know, many citizens of Anazette live on the edge of poverty. Crime is on the rise, your honor. It's understandable. Even with the gendarmes' wages, it's hard to get by. You understand what Lenard is implying, and you assure that the efforts of the gendarmes will be properly rewarded. But after capturing the criminals, gendarmes also have to confirm the fact of the attack in the court. That night, you go for a walk around the city, purposefully choosing empty side streets. Shadows follow you at a distance, gendarmes in, civil, in civilian dress. Ominous silhouettes appear before you, if only they were there before. Uh, the, you examine the faces hidden beneath their hoods. Their clothing is ostentatiously coarse, but their manners and speech betray them as servants from a noble household. The leader speaks, asking if you are a friend of one Sir Thomas Giro. He says that they are his friends too and wish to pay him a visit, but are having trouble finding him. They're attacking the judge. Arrest him. In the blink of an eye, the gendarmes swoop in and round up Auden's henchmen. The blows from the gendarmes club quickly beat any desire to resist out of them. They are put in wooden restraints and taken to the prefecture. Lenard hands you some papers. These are our statements, your honor. We're always happy to help. The same night, with a stroke of a pen, you send all five of Auden's servants to the gallows for attacking a nobleman and a judge. Fortunately, they all are lowborn, so no one will intercede on their behalf, not even Auden himself. The commander will be furious, but he will also have to find some new goons. At the very least, you've brought Thomas some time. You hurry to see your friend, but he is not in his hideout anymore. All you find is a note. Darren, after you got rid of those thugs, I decided to flee Anazette. Without his spies, Auden seems to have lost my trail, and it's all thanks to you. I'm in your eternal debt, Bronte. I hope you take down the ba that bastard and put an end to his crimes once and for all. We'll meet again, your friend, Thomas. I have a feeling that I'm going to die at the end of this. So he's rescued. Wonderful. I'm in a dangerous position. Also wonderful. Wonderful. 
Chutes and Ladders. This is also what I had before, but I had this before because I chose to, you know, side with the um, Steiners or whoever it was. I decided to sign with them and um, things got out of hand. So, yeah. And I'm not going to do this decision, so screw it again. News of your latest actions spread rapidly across Anazet. You've made many enemies during your years as a judge, and now is their chance to strike. Your career is hanging by a thread. You have to fight off accusations, denouncements, and slander just to retain your position. A quiet knock at the door interrupts your musings. The imposing figure of George Carlo Falkengraben solemnly floats into your office. We hardly ever see each other these days, Bronte. I've literally seen you once. I've decided to pay you a visit with the most cordial of intentions, of course. I've been hearing everywhere that things are not going well for you. So I asked myself the question, how can a man of your talents quarrel with almost all of Anazet's high society? Because I have a benefactor who does fuck all for me. I'm sure you are simply misguided. I really am, but worry not. I will show you the way. Many judges see you as a threat. What other judges? I've never seen any of them. They think that your daring rulings are putting the entire prefecture in danger because I'm the only one ruling. Let's examine your latest case, for instance. Its outcome enraged all the nobility of the city. You mean the one where I decided to let the, the, the noble guy off even though he was a douche, that one? But I know you aren't what they say you are. The others need to see how much you care for your colleagues in our institutions. Take my advice, Darren. Don't forget that it is a judge's job to maintain law and order among the estates, not destroy it. Admit your error and reconsider at least some of your past decisions in favor of the nobility. Do this and I assure you, society will come to see you as a respectable nobleman and a wise judge once again. Do not emulate our prefect. You know that I hold Elborn in the highest esteem, but between you and me, he's on the edge of a precipice and he's dragging you down with him. Promise me you'll think about what I've said, Bronte. I'm only concerned about your well-being. I care about the career of a promising judge like you. Falkengraben takes a bow and leaves as silently as he came. You reread your latest cases. Lost in thought, this is what has turned high society against you. Your enemy's schemes are preventing you from continuing your work. You need to find a way out of this situation. I can't ask a powerful benefactor because I'm just boning her. I actually don't have her help. Um, even though I helped her quite a bit. Let me see. Oh, I can ask my father for help, which will ruin my reputation with my family, but it will save me, kind of. I can annul my decisions, which will knock justice down by three, Jesus Christ. Diplomacy will go up one. Huh. Yeah, diplomacy. Okay. Or I can continue the fight and lose the last bit of career that I have left. Hey, but my valor will go up. Ah. Uh. Uh, I'm pretty much going to have to say screw my family because I, I'm not going to be able to get that reputation up unless some magical choice is going to come up here pretty soon where I just get plus five reputation because I'm a masterful diplomat who's invisible in combat, who's died twice in combat. That's not going to happen. So I'm going to ask my father for help. Sorry, family, you're going down. And I'm probably not going to be a noble now. So that, that's that's going to be a thing. You walk swiftly to your father's office. No matter what happens, he will always come to your aid. The conversation begins awkwardly. You tell him about your, la your latest rulings, the enemies you've made, and the pressure from Frockengraven and those like him. Will he help you out of your difficulty? Man, if only there was someone I knew that I made a promise to who was a powerful person who could help me. Having carefully listened to your account, father frowns. You are, in a, you are in dire straits indeed. You know that I will always be on your side, but now you've gone too far. It's my fault too, Darren. It's time we got you out of this mess. Our family has still managed has still managed to build a reputation over the past few years. I'll arrange meetings with some important noblemen and plead your case. Like predatory beasts, they will smell our vulnerabil vulnerability. As soon as you ask for a favor, you become not only an in, or not only a debtor but also a prospective victim. But we have no choice, otherwise you will lose your position as a judge. But promise me, son, that from now on you will be more cautious and refrain from making more enemies for our family. 
You assure a father that you will do, do your utmost. Then you awkwardly thank him for his help. He pats you on the shoulder in response and picks up his quill pen. Letters, letters, entreaties, and humiliating visits await him. God, I, oh God, I swear, Elborn is useless. I should have just went ahead and been a corrupt douchebag. Yeah, I have tarnished honor now for our reputation. Wonderful. But yeah, that's, that's just, oh God. <laughs> Masterful diplomat my ass. El Pharaoh's list. You spend day after day hard at work, toiling over Auden's case, but something far more urgent demands the prefecture's attention. The city is in chaos. There was an explosion in the square in front of, uh, in front of the city hall. Wow, thanks. Someone threw a bomb at the magistrate Remio Vermin's carriage. The assassination attempt failed. Damn. The magistrate was not inside the carriage at the time. Plan this out a little bit better. He was unharmed, although his servants and driver did not fare so well. Even in your office, you can still smell the, the acrid smoke from the blast. And again, this also might be a false flag operation. The gender means react quickly. Five suspects, craftsmen and factory workers, were brought to the prefecture before sunset. They are accused of joining the last straw, a secret society of insurgents seeking to overthrow imperial rule. The society is on its way to becoming the talk of the city. Rumor has it their leader is an enigmatic woman, a tough criminal by the name of Sophia. The five, sus the five suspects deny their involvement but a number of eyewitnesses saw them walking towards the square, and some of them still have traces of gunpowder on their fingers. George Carlo Falkengraven has taken the case. Suspicious. The trial will be mercilessly swift. The five are to be hanged tomorrow morning. The sun begins to set. You are about to leave for home when you hear heavy footsteps in the hallway. A stranger enters your office. He is, a, he is pale with, with chiseled features, a furrowed brow, a thick black mustache and dark eyes watching you intently from deep within their sockets. He's Zorro. He presents you with a gilded pendant in the shape of a wheel. Baron Philippe El Ferro, secret chancellery advisor. I imagine you're well aware that we deal with plots, schemes, and revolts against the Empire. I have a matter of great importance to the Empire to discuss with you, Sir Bronte. I am aware that the case of the explosion in the square was not assigned to you, but for our purposes, this is actually for the best. The secret chancellery has been following this so-called last straw group for a long time now. They are the greatest threat to the peace in Anazet, but you can keep, but you can help us rid the city of this menace. Baron El Ferro produces a neatly folded sheet of paper. This is a list of known insurgents connected to the last straw. They haven't blown anyone up just yet, but surely you realize that it would be most imprudent to wait for them to commit their next crime. The time to act is now. You scan the list quickly. Some of the names on it seem somewhat familiar, perhaps from your youth. Find a way, any way, to implicate them in today's assassination attempt, and you will prevent more explosions in the future. The Empire will rest easy if we can rid ourselves of this scum as quickly as possible. If you render this service to the secret chancellery, you may rely on my assistance in the future. As you may suspect, they have more than my fair share of powerful connections. Silence falls. The secret chancellery advisor pierces you with his heavy gaze. Huh. I can protect the people on the list, which again would bone my career. Um, justice will go up by two. Reputation will go down by one. Um, unity in my family would go up by one. My valor would be invisible, invincible. So there's that. Um, willpower will go down by five. Or I could obey the chancellery. I would get the patronage of power of the powerful. Power will go down by one. My career will go up by two. Justice will go down by two. Unity will go down by two. Jesus. Robert Bronte goes down by one. Why does he go down by one? Um, I could conduct an invest. Uh, yeah, I can't do that. 
Uh, wealth would have to be greater than one. It's now at a seven. Also, my scheming would need to be greater than 10. It's now at an eight. Um, that could have helped a lot. Unfortunately, I don't have the aspects of that. Um, you know, yeah, I, I have a lot of thoughts about the stuff that's happening now. Um, shelter the suspect. Uh, ah, so Gloria is tangled up in this. Wonderful. Let's see, justice down by one. Yep, unity would have been up by one. Wealth would have went up by one. Yep, mm, if only I could have done that. But I had to know Gloria's secret and my manipulation had to be greater than or equal to 10. Wonderful. Um, you know, I would probably recommend uh, to the developers uh, if, you know, just a small bit of advice. You might want to change that Valor stat because for one, you mentioned in the first part that like Valor is a big thing if you're a judge. It's done fuck all. So <laughs> I would recommend that you put manipulation in there because I've needed that a couple times now or scheming. I've needed that several times now. And I think scheming is something for the Inquisition or something like that. I don't know. But uh, yeah, you might want to make that recommendation for somewhere else because Jesus Christ. Um, sure. Obey the secret chancellery. Jesus Christ. My family's destroyed. My, my, my family's destroyed. Thanks. You sigh heavily and manage to nod. Baron of Pharaoh allows her, himself a reassuring half smile. I'm glad to see we understand each other, Bronte. I will put in a good word for you with my connections. You're a much more agreeable man than your prefect. Perhaps you might take his place one day, but until that happens, you may call for my assistance in matters that require particular, particular discretion. A long, sleepless night follows. Ten new cases lie, upon, lie open before you. Genemy set up ambushes and catch every soul on El Farrell's list. You fabricate witness statements and describe non-existent evidence tying these ten people to, to the five to the five behind the assassination attempt against the magistrate. One by one, the ten prisoners appear in your office to hear their verdict. You do not look at them. You would rather not remember the faces of the people you send to the hereafter. The morning after, ten more people join the five that have already been sent to the gallows. Back at home, Father asks you about the case. He is furious when he learns the truth. I cannot believe it. Those people were never proven guilty, and yet you sent them off to die. Yeah, if only you were doing your job as a judge. You quote Philippe, The end justifies the means when you're fighting an insurgency. If you take too long to eradicate the threat, it might be too late. Even though that's not what I would say. I never thought I'd hear my own son say such things. The shame. The disgrace. You should never have done this. We serve the law. We don't break it. Have you seen this city? You yourself have broken the law, sir. Your sister Gloria also hears about these events from your father. That execution, it was you. I knew those people. Three of them were our neighbors. This is horrible. How could you do such a thing, Darren? Because nobody else does anything. They just somehow magically managed to throw it on my lot. After that day, you and father barely speak at home. At work, you only talk about work. The rest of the prefecture soon notices the change. Don't take it so hard, Bronte. Everyone has their principles. Sometimes they just don't line up. The world wouldn't need any judges if that was true. Your father blames you, but if you ask me, I say you did your duty. Had you refused the secret chancellery, it would have meant nothing but disaster for all of us. What kind of justice could we expect then? However, the quarrel with father goes on and on. You begin to feel uncomfortable at home. You start spending more and more time at work with each passing day. Yeah, because the, the girl who was helping me out has just vanished off the face of the earth who can't help me. So yeah, good God. Ugh. I'm angry. I am really angry, Jesus. Patronage of the powerful, event has happened. Gain the powerful patron. You earn the favor of someone very powerful indeed. That really better pay off. That really better pay off at some point. 
The year is 1144, the Archduke relents. After many years, the simmering, unceasing hostilities between the overseer Gaius Tempus and Archduke Milanatus have finally come to an end. The Archduke has abandoned all attempts to collect additional taxes from the people. By my grace, I hereby release the common people of Magra from the Archduke's taxes. All hail the dynasty of Milanatus, which has protected you since time immemorial. The farmers and merchants can finally have a sigh of relief. Unexpectedly, the Archduke soon withdrew from all provincial affairs, sequestering himself in his ancestral castle of Serpent Verda. The gentry who remain loyal to the Archduke are baffled. Has he accepted defeat at the hands of the Overseer, or is this just an elaborate ruse? Either way, with the Archduke out of the picture, the senior gentry of Magra have lost some of their influence to the Overseer, and his retinue of budding di dynasties and nobles of the mantle. The feud between the two Archnean rulers have ended, but the noble estate has been split nonetheless. The common people see this as yet another reason to demand change. So hey, the struggle for power went back up. The wealth of Magra is now secure. Seventh year of service. Another year of service as a judge is behind you, but you have no time to celebrate. Your days are filled with unremarkable litigation and similar looking complaints. Again and again, you see poorly written complaint forms. They claim that noble landowners or landowners are extorting money, punishing commoners for nothing, doing whatever they please. You have noticed a change in tone from pleading to desperate to quietly furious. The lowborn lot is to suffer, but how much longer can they endure? Every day, once the petty litigation has been dealt with, you return to Auden's case. Again and again, for two years now, you search for a way to do the unthinkable, to have an Archnean, the high commander at that, convicted for his crimes. You have not heard from Auden since your encounter at the city hall, but likely, but he likely has spies among the judges and gendermies. Sooner or later, he would realize the true state of your progress and find a way to get rid of this case and you unless you're prepared to strike the first blow. But what should you do? Will you speak against Auden in public and summon him to a trial? Is there any other way to deal with the high commander? Either way, now is not the time. And so you wait and prepare. Justice for all. So I'm going to end it right here. And then in the next chapter, I'm assuming that this will be the end of this chapter. Well, excuse me, in the next episode, I'm assuming that this will be the end of this chapter and on into the next chapter, if I live that long. So, yeah, I mean, I, I do have a lot of thoughts about this. It's It's been very infuriating. As much as I like this game, it does the typical thing that a lot of choice of games do, which is sometimes these stats just really don't matter. Or they're, they're just ha it just has too many stats and it's compounded a lot of times and then it's just like there's very little chance of certain things happening because of just randomness or just whatever else so in this particular case it's just like come on like like what do you want me to do like if you give me the choice of being a judge and you want me and you say focus on diplomacy and focus on this i'm gonna focus on that and then when it comes out to it it's just like nope you didn't need that so i mean come on i, I can understand certain things but this is kind of getting ridiculous now so but anywho i'm still enjoying the game it's just it's very frustrating and i will say that i'm definitely going to play this again in my own spare time and i'm definitely going to remember some of these choices and act accordingly because good god but at the same time i, I still can't even remember then certain choices that i would make but anywho that that's enough of my rant for the day so anywho if you like the video like the video if you want to see more content like this subscribe I have plenty of things on the channel and I will have plenty of things in the future. Um, yeah. So if you have any comments, questions, concerns, leave them in the comment section. Um, I'm always getting the, you know, messages. They come to my phone, even though I'm usually at work <laughs> around the morning times or whatnot. Now I work from six to three. So yeah, I typically don't have a chance to respond unless I have a spare moment at work, but yeah, I will respond to them as quickly as I possibly can. And again, I thank everyone for watching this series you know again i it's it's not it's i really do appreciate it because again i i don't expect people to watch stuff like this because most people play these games and they are things that you have to do on your own it's not something that you want to actually like you know 
see somebody do jump cuts and stuff up. <laughs> so I get, and then you really can't really do it with these type of games. But yeah, I really do appreciate everything. And I do appreciate everyone who's come to the channel, new or old to watch these videos. I really do appreciate it. So, and again, as much as I complain about choice of games, I played a ton of choice of games and they all have a lot of different issues like this. And I still love, them. you know, I one, one example of this that I can give is a game called 10 star. Um, I think it's a choice of game. It might be a hosted game. They're basically the same, but, um, 10 star is a long game. It has over a million words and it has a ton of choices in it. And there are choices that I have yet to have made. And I've had that game for six, seven years now, I think. But, um, yeah, it's just, it's a lot of choices in there and there's a lot of stats in there. You just wonder like what this stat is for. And it popped up for one particular case. And it's just like, why would I invest into that stat? But this is, that's the breaks when it comes to choice of games. It's frustrating sometimes, but you know, it's still fun and I'm still having fun in this. And I definitely am going to play this a lot more so I can see some of the different routes and stuff like that. But yeah, anywho, I'll see you in the next video. We will have justice for all, but I'm pretty sure I'm going to die by the end of this chapter. Something is going to screw me. It's already screwed me quite a bit, but, uh, anywho, see you in the next one. See you.